All right. Good morning. We're going to get this symposium started. Thank you all for joining us on this wonderful Saturday morning on a beautiful day in Philadelphia. So my name is Christopher Velez. I am a gastroenterologist at Mass General, a alumnus of Digest um, 3. And I have my colleague here, Darren Patel, um, who will be moderating the panel with me. And the panel and the symposium is entitled Gastro is entitled Functional and Motility Disorders in Cystic Fibrosis. The question mark being intentional because that is something that has not yet been defined and probably would be hotly debated among a lot of you attending here today if one could have a functional and motility disorder while one has a diagnosis of, diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. So gastrointestinal symptoms are common in patients with cystic fibrosis. As I like to remind my very well-intentioned pulmonary colleagues that cystic fibrosis was a digestive disease before it was a pulmonary disease. Um, structural and organ-based abnormalities predominate in patients with cystic fibrosis in terms of the pathology in the different organ systems, reproductive, gastrointestinal, respiratory, rooted in the same mutation in the, in the CFTR gene. Um, and we have classic conditions that are known to be related to cystic fibrosis, including exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, CF-related diabetes, and distal intestinal obstruction syndrome. Beyond these well-defined disease entities, gastrointestinal symptoms remain remarkably common in patients with CF, even when they don't have an episode of distal intestinal obstruction syndrome, even when they don't have um, loose bowel movements in the setting of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So this is a list of the symptoms that I think everyone in this room have heard their patients complain of. Nausea, vomiting, bloating, flatulence, et cetera. And there are some times where it's pretty easy to control these symptoms, but there are patients that have these symptoms on a more regular basis, and it becomes challenging in these more indolent parts of their presentation to manage their symptom burden. So everyone that you're gonna hear from today is an alumnus of the Digest program of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. So we are gastroenterologists that have been a part of CFF-sponsored training for the past three years. Some of us are adults, some of us are pediatric. Those of us like me on the adult side are always eager to learn from our pediatric colleagues because we're still not the best on the adult side in terms of managing long-term patients with cystic fibrosis. And why, but why have a CF specialized gastroenterologist? We are a rare commodity. Um, we are able to apply our knowledge to the care of gastrointestinal issues in patients who don't have CF and able to replicate what we do for um, patients with cystic fibrosis. And now that we're in the modulator therapy and in the next 20 to 30 years, we're gonna have patients with CF approaching more and more normal lifespans. Now it's when the other symptoms and trials and tribulations of daily life will start predominating. So symptoms impact quality of life, and symptoms can be daily or most of the time. And those same symptoms that I showed you in this diagram back here are symptoms that patients may not volunteer to you. I often have to ask explicitly um, if patients are having these symptoms, and people will say things like, are you constipated? No, well, how often do you move your bowels? Oh, once a week, clearly abnormal. But patients with CF, I think, are among the most resilient that I work with and are less keen to volunteer issues, particularly if respiratory considerations predominate. So functional and motility disorders in CF. So I posit that we've all had patients that will call you Friday at 4.59 saying that they are bloated, they haven't moved their bowels, you're concerned about distal intestinal obstruction syndrome, you are prepared to mobilize a on-call radiology suite or clinical service to perform a gastrograph and enema, and then they shoot a preliminary chest x-ray, and there's nothing there. There's no stool, there's no obstruction, there's no bowel, um, but no bowel dilation. Or you have someone who you treat for exocrine pancreatic insufficiency related to cystic fibrosis, and they're complaining about worsened bowel movements, and you're convinced they're not taking the enzymes correctly, they're not storing them correctly, maybe they are trying to lose a little weight, 
since they've been on Trikafta, ETI, and they're trying to induce a little bit of malabsorption in order to help lose the weight. But then you do a 72-hour stool collection on a high-fat diet, and it looks like actually that they have a normal um, fat content. How do we reconcile these things? <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Um, I am Duren Patel. I'm pediatric GI, um, but at the same time, um, motility physician. So you're going to hear a lot of motility words uh, in the talk today, it's especially at the end. So can functional um, GI disorder and motility disorder exist together, um, especially when you've been taught CFTR dysfunction um, is present, hence you can't have, you know, any functional GI disorder. Um, that turns out to be, um, you know, questionable now, since that we have the whole separate classification called DGBI, which stands for Disorder of Gut and Brain Interaction. Um, I just want to give a little bit, you know, um, background on, you know, this two often simultaneously used terminology. Um, functional GI disorder means the pain or discomfort, um, you know, where what patient feels. Motility on the other side is predominantly motor manifestation where you actually have issues with the transit or the delay in emptying time. So um, functional and motility often used together, but those are separate mechanisms. One is predominantly sensory and one is motor. Um, all right, keeping in the time of interest, um, I'll just overarching, you know, um, theme of our GI session today. Um, as Chris says earlier, we all are digest alumni under um, Sarah Jane Schwarzenberg and um, Dr. Steve Frieden's mentorship. We um, um, accomplished our cohort very recently in June, um, and everybody had a distinct project, and we're going to um, highlight a couple of, you know, um, important um, topics today. So. Few housekeeping things. Um, I was told that when you actually answer a question um, in your, you know, um, smart app, um, it goes de default on the discussion section. So if you could just quickly, you know, change to question. If you have a, a question, it would be appreciated. Um, we have. Um, five distinct speakers today. So first, um, uh, we will go through the uh, gastrointestinal reflux or gastroesophageal reflux, excuse me, uh, and impacts on lungs, um, followed by IBS, DIOS, uh, and bacterial overgrowth, um, followed by gastroparesis uh, and management, and lastly, we will have point and counterpoint arguing um, on the foregut motility testing. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Nicole Green and Jody Barkin is not here um, physically, so we have pre-recorded session uh, on behalf of them. Um, and we will move on to next. Right, let's see. And also feel free to send in the question and answer session questions throughout the speakers. We've been asked to go from speaker to speaker, and we'll have a longer question and answer session at the end because I suspect um, while we are trying to divide up the tract into distinct regions, there are going to be a lot of questions that overlap between different organ systems. So it's better to have the entire from gum to bum discussion of the GI tract, and then we can um, frame questions um, as they relate to different anatomic regions at the end for about 20 minutes. All right, so the first speaker is Dr. Jeffrey King. Um, Dr. King is the Chief of Gastroenterology and Medical Director of GI Procedure Unit and Associate Professor of Medicine at National Jewish Health. Um, he serves as GI Service Line Director with the partnership between National Jewish Health and St. Joseph Hospital in Denver, Colorado. Since joining the faculty in 2014, he's been the main GI consultant um, for the group. Um, apart from his interest in CF-related GI manifestation, his expertise includes the impact of GERD and esophageal dysmotility on lung disease. Um, he is a member of, like all of us, uh, in Digest 3, uh, and is currently an active participant of the research group that we are all um, part of, um, uh, exploring GI motility testing pattern amongst uh, uh, a pre- and um, post-lung transplant recipients. He's also conducting, um, uh, he's also the site PI for the NICE CF study, which is uh, the study for colon cancer screening. Um, today, Dr. King will be presenting the gastroesophageal reflux disease and its impact on lungs. So, Dr. King. Thank you, Darren and Chris, for inviting me to speak about this very important uh, topic and one that I hope by the end 
everybody has a little bit of a different uh, understanding and appreciation for. Um, let's see here. So uh, during this talk, um, what I really want to stress is we are not going to spend any time really talking about the impact of reflux on the esophagus. What I really want to cover is the overlap between reflux disease and lung disease in cystic fibrosis patients. And uh, in particular, I want you to understand that our current uh, knowledge of this area is very is based on very heterogeneous testing and heterogeneous study design and uh, much of the recommendations that we currently have and follow clinically are based on treating reflux from an esophagus standpoint rather than a lung standpoint so by telling you what we know uh, about reflux in the cystic fibrosis population I hope that what you take out of this is um, there is a much larger piece of this puzzle that we don't know. <clears throat> so first off, I just want to go over um, the anatomy of everything, showing that the uh, lungs are very closely associated uh, with the GI tract. Your throat is one tube in the back of your mouth, and as it goes down into your neck, it breaks off into the two branches, which are the esophagus as well as uh, the airway. Can you guys not see my pointer on the screen? Okay, I can use this then. Sorry. <clears throat> and I just want to go over a few terms that you're going to hear throughout the, the talk. Uh, the first is gastroesophageal reflux disease. And what this is is symptoms or complications of gastric materials coming up the esophagus um, uh, and again, this, what you'll see throughout the talk is that most of the data that we have on reflux in CF is really based on gastroesophageal reflux disease, not necessarily <clears throat> on its impact on the lungs. Secondly, you're going to hear this term LPR, laryngopharyngeal reflux, which is where reflux comes up breaches the upper esophageal sphincter into the throat, but does not necessarily go down into the lower uh, respiratory tract. We'll also talk about aspiration, which is when that material actually does uh, pass the vocal cords and enters the lower respiratory tract. And you'll also hear a new term that has been coined through a working group that we've put together with the CF Foundation to look at the impact of reflux on the lungs, and, it's, and we refer to this as GRASP, or GI-related aspiration. When one is aspirating, it can either be coming anterograde as they are swallowing down into the airway, or it can be coming up from below and entering the airway. And really, the, uh, the area of, of our expertise is really from the GI tract, uh, aspiration contents coming up from the GI tract. And so you'll hear this term grasp throughout my talk. <clears throat> there are multiple mechanisms um, in place that uh, are trying to prevent uh, contents from the GI tract from entering the airway. And these include um, uh, issues with the esophagus, uh, motility issues. There's also uh, sphincters, both at the lower and upper esophagus motility issues along the esophagus, as well as airway-specific mechanisms to try to prevent uh, aspiration. In the CF population, um, there are several of these factors that are um, found more frequently. Uh, CF patients tend to have slower motility, slow gastric emptying. They also can have increased abdominal pressure from changes in lung uh, mechanics. Uh, as you'll see in the subsequent slides, CF patients tend to have more reflux. They have decreased pleural pressures due to increased work of breathing, dysmotility of the esophagus, as well as dysfunction in the mucociliary barrier within the airway. So CF patients are ripe for issues of grasp. So what is known about reflux in CF? 
Um, much of what we know is based on questionnaires. And uh, what this particular questionnaire showed is that nearly two-thirds of, uh, two of CF patients had at least one reflux symptom, including heartburn, regurgitation, and dysphagia. Of those patients, about a third had occasional symptoms, with a quarter of them having at least weekly symptoms. So this is a significant issue. And when you talk to patients who have reflux symptoms, about a quarter of them will say that they think that there is a contribution between their reflux and exacerbation of their pulmonary symptoms. So there does seem to be at least a symptomatic overlap between reflux and lung symptoms. When you look at objective reflux testing, particularly elevated esophageal acid exposure time, you find that upwards of 90% of CF patients can have abnormal testing by traditional ambulatory uh, pH testing. <clears throat> now, almost more importantly, is that nearly two-thirds of patients who have abnormal reflux, so-called abnormal reflux testing, will actually have no reflux symptoms. So relying simply on symptoms when deciding who to work up for reflux and who to treat for reflux, particularly with, with regard to the lungs, you are going to end up missing many, many patients. When you look at the non-CF population, um, these numbers are much, much lower, only about a quarter of patients having reflux. Now, what I'll show you in the subsequent slides is that mo many of our reflux studies have been heterogeneous in methodology, some using questionnaires, um, others using acid, uh, traditional acid pH testing, and others using pH impedance testing. <clears throat> there are rare prospective reflux studies using our current pH impedance testing, um, which is able to measure both acid and non-acid reflux. And of these studies, there are zero, none, that actually report non-acid reflux. So this is the standard of care right now for the evaluation of reflux is traditionally pH impedance testing. But all of the studies that we have, even in CF, even the ones using this technology, actually do not report non-acid reflux, which, as you'll see, Later on in the talk may be playing a, a very significant role in lung disease. <clears throat> Based on prior uh, barium testing, when, when we look at patients who have abnormal reflux on barium testing and compare them to CF patients who do not have reflux on barium testing, what you find is that those with reflux tend to have decreased lung function. In addition, we found that bile aspiration, so bile, there should be no other reason why that is in the lungs other than it is coming up from the GI tract. Bile aspiration tends to decrease pulmonary biodiversity. It's involved in biofilm formation, emergence of dominant pathogens, as well as causing direct lung damage. And when you compare cystic fibrosis patients to healthy controls and patients with other types of lung disease or symptoms, including chronic cough and asthma, what you see is that cystic fibrosis patients are more likely to have bile acids in their sputum. Furthermore, those with more, the more bile acids that we find in the sputum, the higher certain inflammatory markers are. So the, there does seem to be a correlation between bile aspiration and inflammation, and also the more bile acids that we find in sputum, the decrease, that it tends to be associated with a decrease in lung function. There was a European uh, epidemiologic registry of CF patients where they looked at over 7,000 patients in a cross-sectional manner, um, and they tried to identify factors that were associated with decreased lung function on enrollment to the registry. And what they found is that GERD actually fell out as one of the predictors of decreased lung function. Now, here's the problem with this uh, report is that the, in the actual study, it says that the registry provided no definition of gastroesophageal reflux. And consequently, this potential relationship remains to be confirmed. So, while this relationship between reflux and decreased lung function has been posited, there are very few uh, objective studies to show that. This is uh, the first case report out of uh, Duke University showing 
a direct impact of reflux on uh, CF patients in the post-transplant uh, world. What this, this is a patient who was transplanted in 1995, and you can see quickly within the first six to nine months, they started to have a slight decrease in lung function. There was no association with rejection or infection. The patient was treated with steroids, antibiotics, with, no, with a continued decline in their lung function. They were eventually re-transplanted approximately two years later, again showing an initial improvement in lung function, but very quickly after um, decreasing again. There was a concern for reflux at this time. Uh, the patient had an upper endoscopy showing severe reflux esophagitis. They had delayed gastric emptying, as well as a barium study showing reflux up to the clavicles. The patient was treated with aggressive acid suppression, as well as a cisopride, a promotility agent, with continued decline in their lung function. And the patient ultimately underwent an anti-reflux surgery again with improvement in lung function. <clears throat> this is a later study looking at 43 patients, both pre and post lung transplant. This cohort included six patients with cystic fibrosis. All of them had so-called GERD, and here is the definition that they used, um, which again, I, uh, none of these except probably for Barrett's esophagus is a traditional diagnostic criterion for reflux, as you'll see in a little bit, but that's how they defined reflux in this study. 41 out of these 43 patients had reflux surgery. Those with normal motility had a Nissen fundoplication, and those with severe dysmotility had a partial fundoplication. And when they looked at uh, measures of lung function before anti-reflux surgery and after anti-reflux surgery, it was clear that after anti-reflux surgery, all measures of lung function improved, both post-transplant as well as pre-transplant. And in those post-lung transplant, you also saw a decrease in the rate of pneumonia as well as rejection. In the lung transplant literature, you can find uh, reports showing that increased acid exposure in the esophagus and elevated Demeester scores in pre-transplant reflux testing is associated with the development of chronic lung allograft dysfunction, as well as bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome. In addition, proximal reflux, so that reflux coming up closest to the airway, correlates with inflammation within the airway and is linked to allograft dysfunction and mortality. The presence of reflux pre-transplant, when you break out those who had reflux and those who did not have reflux, what you will see is very quickly after transplant, there is a decrease in lung function in those patients with GERD, and you also see a decrease in uh, survival or morta increased mortality in those with reflux. So where does our current reflux testing fall short? What I wanted to, to stress is that we are currently measuring reflux from an esophagus standpoint and not from a lung standpoint. So here is the, uh, our current criteria that we use to diagnose pathologic reflux. This, this is the so-called Lyon uh, consensus criteria. And what I want you to, to get from this is that uh, evidence of pathologic reflux is generally based on increased acid exposure time or findings on upper endoscopy. What this chart does not state is how it defines pathologic reflux is what is abnormal or pathologic for the esophagus. When we diagnose reflux, based on traditional reflux testing, the parameters we use are what is abnormal and what is predictive of abnormalities and damage within the esophagus. None of these criteria say anything about what is pathologic with regard to the airway. And so one of the things that we are working on right now is trying to determine if our current criteria to diagnose reflux are applicable when we're talking about the lungs or not. This consensus actually, uh, even though the, you'll see total number of reflux episodes as being borderline evidence of reflux, 
what the consensus states is that the clinical relevance of the abnormal number of reflux episodes remains incompletely defined, and this is very important, that the assessment of proximal esophageal reflux or pharyngeal reflux has been proposed, but the methodology and interpretation have not been standardized and outcome studies are currently lacking. So while we, we often use these parameters in clinical decision making, there is no agreed upon consensus about exactly how to use these parameters. So where does our current reflux treatment fall short? Well, what we know from the CF registry is that over approximately 50% of adults with CF are currently uh, on a PPI. And an additional 10 to 15% are on an H2 blocker. So many of our patients are on acid suppression. This, uh, again, these next two uh, graphs on this slide are, if you take nothing else away from this entire talk, these are the two things I want you to pay attention to. The, what this shows is this is a comparison of number of reflux episodes, both in the proximal, mid, and distal esophagus, in patients in the red bar who are off of PPI therapy, and in the orange bar, those that are on PPI therapy. And what you can see clearly is that acid-reducing medications alone do nothing to reduce the number of reflux events, and thus probably have very little effect on the impact of reflux on the lungs. <clears throat> Additionally, in patients who are not on PPIs, there's often a mixture of acid and non-acid reflux. In this study, patients were put on twice, a, twice daily omeprazole for one week, had repeat reflux testing. Statistically, there was absolutely zero change in the total number of reflux events. What happens when we put patients on these strong acid-reducing medications is all of that reflux goes from the acid column over to the non-acid column. So we're doing nothing to change the amount of reflux, we're just changing the type of reflux, which likely has no effect on the lungs. Is acid suppression detrimental to our C? Can we take this one step further, and, and, and are we just not treating reflux appropriately, but are we potentially hurting our patients by put thing, putting them on acid-reducing medications? Well, there's a randomized controlled study looking at CF patients with GERD symptoms. These patients had uh, frequent pulmonary exacerbations, they had reflux testing, and then they were randomized to twice daily Nexium versus placebo, and then they were followed for a year and a half. About 60% of these patients had abnormal pH testing. Again, these are all patients without reflux symptoms, so silent reflux. And of the patients who were randomized to the PPI arm, over half had an exacerbation whereas only a quarter of those on placebo had an exacerbation. So this study reported an, inc an increased odds ratio for uh, time to exacerbation for those on a PPI. Additionally, there was a retrospective review looking at hospitalizations for pulmonary exacerbations over one year. There was a PPI uh, arm in this study. Uh, though all those patients had to have been on a PPI for six months prior to enrollment and then continued the PPI for the entire year of the study. They all had GERD based, again, only on symptoms. None of these patients actually had reflux testing. And what they found is that those on a PPI had an increased risk of hospitalization for, uh, for pulmonary exacerbations. And the, the, no one knows for sure why this happens, but the theory is that the less acid we have in our stomach, the less we are um, killing the bacteria that we may, we may ingest during the day. And if we are refluxing, now that reflux is bringing with it more bacteria getting over into the lungs and causing more exacerbations, inflammation, and infections. So <clears throat> the, at the end of the day, when we talk about grasp or reflux getting over into the lungs, this is what we are trying to fix. We're trying to prevent microaspiration. And there are many, many factors that go into contributing to microaspiration in these patients. When we put these patients on acid reducing medications, this is the only thing in this entire chart that we are affecting. We are not affecting any of the other factors that are increasing a patient's risk for aspiration. And so this is where I think our current methodology and mindset with regard to this falls short. So 
future directions. First off, I think we are thinking about this the wrong way. We are starting by, uh, by measuring who has abnormal reflux and then figuring out, based on that testing, who is going to have problems with the lungs. I think we first need to determine how do we diagnose aspiration first, and then we need to work back from that, and we need to identify surrogate markers, whether that's sputum testing, reflux testing, that can use, be used to predict a patient's individual risk for GRASP. And then once we find that, we can determine clinical interventions to reduce their risk. And uh, through that, we'll be able to come up with consensus recommendations. So my take home points are that GERD is highly prevalent in the CF community, that GRASP can contribute to lung dysfunction, infection risk, and advanced lung disease in CF patients and that evaluating and treating reflux from a standard GI approach where we are really thinking about standard uh, criteria for diagnosing abnormal reflux and treating reflux from an esophagus standpoint falls short in regard to lung uh, disease and grasp. Thank you very much. All right, excellent talk, Dr. King. Our next speaker is Dr. Christian Hashim. Um, Dr. Hashim is a professor of medicine in the Division of GI at St. Louis University. She has engaged in public and patient family uh, education on the importance of gastroenterology topics for the CF community with the focus on colon cancer screening in individuals with CF. She has um, served on numerous local, regional, national committees um, and quality of care um, initiatives. She is the governor of American College of Gastroenterology Society in Missouri. She is also currently the principal investigator of multi-centered study NICE-CF um, in conjunction with CF Foundation, looking at the stool-based col colorectal cancer screening options and individuals with CF. Um, she's going to discuss um, irritable bowel syndrome, DIOS, and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So, Dr. Hashim. Thank you uh, for inviting me to the CF Foundation and the moderators. So I'll be doing the vegetable soup, IBS, SIBO, and DOS in CF. All right, no disclosures, I'm also a digest awardee. My objectives today are to recognize the symptoms and treatment options for irritable bowel syndrome in individuals with CF, discuss challenges in the diagnosis and management of dysbiosis in small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or SIBO, in CF, and then compare variable treatment options in DOS and constipation. Let's start with the first. What is irritable bowel syndrome? I like this cartoon. I'm afraid that your irritable bowel syndrome has progressed. You now have furious and vindictive bowel syndrome. And I'm sure we all have uh, patients that have can uh, relate. So there's an actual Rome 4 definition for IBS, recurrent abdominal pain or discomfort. You have to have it for more than a day a week in the past three months with two of the three features. Improvement of the pain and discomfort with defecation and or onset associated with the change in stool frequency and or onset associated with the change in stool form. You have to have symptoms for at least six months before diagnosis. And we really try to focus on a positive symptom diagnosis in our non-CF population. So we try to minimize testing, invasive procedures, et cetera. So the simple definition of IBS maybe in cystic fibrosis is it's chronic and episodic abdominal pain or discomfort associated with altered bowel habits. So they either have constipation or diarrhea or alternating. And so it's no wonder that IBS seems to be common in cystic fibrosis because of the criteria that's met. 65% in one study met Rome 4 criteria. But I'll tell you that um, there's an overlap with the constipation definition in cystic fibrosis itself. So we know that with the advent of all these great therapies, highly effective modulator therapy, that the pulmonary symptoms are getting better. The lung function is improving, but what we see is now that in our CF clinics that the GI symptoms are outweighing many of the lung problems in our patients with CF. 
And we know from the Galaxy data that GI symptoms are very prevalent. Um, in this survey, uh, looking at community voice uh, participants as well as uh, CF care providers, uh, we see that um, a number of our patients report bloating, distension, and fullness, which represents dys dysbiosis and dysmotility. And we also see a smaller number in this part that report constipation, diarrhea, and incontinence. And we know that the symptoms are also usually reported as moderate to very severe. Um, I take care of adult GI patients, and we can see in the adult uh, age greater than 18, the green bars, that across the board, over 20% report symptoms such as incomplete bowel movements, straining, fullness, bloating, and distension. So all uh, meeting criteria for IBS diagnosis. And the problem is that um, the impact of highly effective modulators on GI symptoms uh, based on this survey is that modulator therapy did not improve GI symptoms in Galaxy. If you kind of focus on the, the orange uh, column, extremely helpful, and you look at abdominal pain, constipation, and diarrhea, you can see most people who responded in the survey did not feel that these were very helpful. So I mentioned that our cystic fibrosis population meets criteria for IBS based on Rome criteria. Uh, but we know that that's based on a non-CF population. Uh, but our treatment goals are likely the same in terms of really improving quality of life by reducing pain, normalizing bowel habits, and improving day-to-day -day functioning. So in general for IBS, based on the non-CF population, and we often do apply this to our CF patients, is we look at uh, reducing fat or caloric load or carbohydrates if there's a lot of bloating or diarrhea component, uh, avoid adding fiber of constipation. Uh, sorbitol or fructose or dairy or gluten can be triggers for uh, GI symptoms. And so we often have our individuals with CF look and do a food diary or behavioral diary. We think about pharmacologic therapy for IBS as studied in the non-CF population. If there's a component of pain or bloating, you might consider antispasmodics, such as anticholinergics, uh, uh, hyosamine or dicyclamine. Peppermint oil may also help with pain. Uh, Dr. Patel alluded to the brain-gut dysfunction. So for pain issues uh, and hyper sens hypersensitivity, we talk about antidepressants, more for pain neuromodulation with TCAs and SSRIs and SNRIs. We can also use 5-HT3 antagonists, such as uh, Elocitron, for the pain issues, and 5-HT4 agonists, also for pain. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about antibiotics um, in the SIBO uh, component of this talk, because we know that there's an overlap with SIBO and IBS. Probiotics have also been studied and used, but with um, variable efficacy. If there's a diarrhea predominance, and we know that the pancreas is exocrine insufficiency seems to be in check, uh, we think this is more related to possible irritable bowel syndrome. We might use opioid, opiate agonists, such as loperamide, uh, more scheduled rather than as needed. Iluaxidine, or vibirazine, has been used as well for IBS with diarrhea. We know that there may be a bile acid diarrhea component, so I will often use cholesteramine or cholestopol, but with caution in my CF population. 5-HT3 antagonists have also been used for IBS diarrhea. Again, we're really trying to treat the symptoms uh, and our individuals with CF. Uh, rifaximin, again, for the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth component, and probiotics and calcium channel blockers for more diarrhea symptoms. If they have more constipation symptoms that meet criteria for IBS, I might consider, again, psyllium. Uh, we know that a mainstay of treatment for cystic fibrosis and constipation, whether it be IBS or CF-related constipation, we use a lot of osmotic laxatives, prokinetics, and 5-HT4 agonists, such as tegaceride or procalipride, chloride channel agonists, uh, levoprostone or amatiza, and guanylate cyclic agonists, such as linaclotide or plaquenotide. But I, I mentioned that slide for possible therapies in cystic fibrosis, but I put forth to you that there's certainly some challenges and questions for diagnosing IBS and cystic fibrosis. 
The question is, is the pathophysiology of IBS different in persons with cystic fibrosis? And Dr. Patel alluded to this, is, is this really CF-related constipation or diarrhea? We don't know. Is a positive symptom diagnosis and management strategy enough in persons with CF? Uh, I, I mentioned in the non-CF population, we really try to minimize ex, uh, excessive testing, imaging, and endoscopy. But is that enough in cystic fibrosis? And we don't know. Uh, there is potentially a, a wider differential. We often know that our cystic fibrosis patients may have pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, so is that, does that explain the diarrhea? They're at higher risk for malignancies at a younger age, so a higher uh, threshold for doing invasive testing may be needed in cystic fibrosis if you're suspecting or they meet criteria for IBS. And do the treatments for IBS in persons with cystic fibrosis work as well? I mentioned all the number of treatments. Those are all based on a non-CF population, and we don't yet know. So now I'll discuss challenges in the diagnosis and management of dysbiosis in small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. So we know that also our cystic fibrosis population uh, endorses gas and bloating. And this is likely due to the underlying dysmotility, uh, as well as multiple prior surgeries, frequent antibiotic use. PPI use has been touted, but really not shown to be significant factor in, in uh, meta-analyses. And I mentioned already the IBS and SIBO overlap. But we do know that they seem to be at increased risk for small bowel bacterial overgrowth, which leads to bacterial activity, hard to see this, um, uh, which leads to bile deconjugation, increased cytokine response. You get symptoms such as steatorrhea, fat-soluble vitamin deficiency, intestinal villi damage, which leads to brush border damage, and then disruption of intestinal villi then leads to increased intestinal permeability, uh, loss of disaccharidesis, and decreased carbohydrate transport, and intestinal inflammation, and then you get more malabsorption, weight loss, you can get protein-losing enteropathy, uh, B12 anemia, dyspepsia, symptoms of upper abdominal pain and bloating, decreased IgA secretion, and systemic inflammation. Uh, with that, you get fermentation of unabsorbed carbohydrates, uh, increased hydrogen and methane gas, and more pain, bloating, and diarrhea and constipation. And you can see the overlap with the IBS diagnosis as well. So how do we diagnose and manage SIBO? I, I, I tell you this, but I also tell you there's some challenges, obviously. Uh, studies have shown that 30 to 40 percent of people with CF uh, have SIBO. Uh, how do they diagnose SIBO? Well, um, a breath test is usually the way we diagnose it, but this is challenging in our cystic fibrosis population due to chronic antibiotic use. So you really can't be on antibiotics if you, if you do this test. And in the white um, figure, you can see uh, this is the solid line is a measure of hydrogen, and the dotted line is a measure, measure of methane. And you can see if you give them some sugar water and measure hydrogen, methane, uh, if you see a rise within 90 minutes, it's a positive test for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It's really a, a test that's fraught with a lot of issues, but it's technically one of the better tests that we have. Uh, we can also do endoscopy and sample the small bowel fluid. Um, obviously, this is invasive um, and may be an issue with uh, our cystic fibrosis population that has um, poor lung function and uncommonly done. So in truth, I think uh, in practice, most of us uh, suspect small intestinal bacterial over, over, I'm sorry, suspect bacterial overgrowth and do empiric treatment. So, um, and we treat for 10 to 14 days with whatever antibiotic you want. So metronidazole, rifaximin, uh, sulfamethoxazole or trimethoprim or amoxicillin and clog, uh, augmentin are the most favored treatment options. I show you this slide. This slide is a non-CF uh, population, but this is why most of us in GI use rifaximin. Uh, this is a large study. You can see compared to CF studies, uh, N of 300 in both target one and target two. And what it showed is that rifaximin provided significant improvement in both abdominal pain and stool consistency. Uh, if you look on the right, uh, combining target one and two, you see compared to placebo, where Faximin improved abdominal pain 52% of the time versus a high rate for placebo, if you uh, want to see that. And then improvement in stool consistency was also seen in uh, Rifaximin-treated uh, patients compared to placebo. So uh, most of us, based on these studies, use a lot of Rifaximin for treating small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Uh, the one single study that uh, exists for cystic fibrosis is less supportive, 
Uh, you can see in this study, they looked at individuals at the single center of uh, cystic fibrosis patients, and they found 79 that were eligible and uh, to be evaluated for SIBO. And 23, so about 30%, had a positive glucose breath test. And, and those patients underwent rifaximin 1,200 milligrams times 14 days, which is a little lower than our usual recommended dose um, versus placebo. And then they had questionnaires and a glucose breath test repeat in one month. And what you can see here in the small study in cystic fibrosis is um, on the left are uh, the pediatric patients and on the right are the adult patients. And in this study, uh, rifaximin number of 13 compared to that non-CF population, uh, the eradication rate was 90%, so pretty good, but the symptom improvement was, was very high in the pediatric population of 80%, but no, none of the adults felt sy symptom improvement. And then um, on the placebo, you see that 30% reported symptom improvement in both pediatric and adult, but a much smaller rate of eradication. So you can see why there's certainly challenges in uh, this concept of SIBO and cystic fibrosis, uh, not only in diagnosis, but also in the management. So lastly, I was asked to compare variable treatment options in DOS and constipation. So this has been uh, uh, studied by the EPSCAN CF working group in terms of a definition. So as um, uh, Jeff alluded to, we really need to start with the definition. And for DOS, the definition is complete intestinal obstruction as evidenced by vomiting of bilious material and or fluid levels in the small intestine on abdominal x-ray. You can have a palpable fecal mass in the ileocecum if they're really thin or, or um, an abdominal pain and or distension. And so complete DOS is having all three of these met. Incomplete or impending DOS is two plus three without one. Constipation, and I ask you to, to think about what I mentioned in terms of the Rome 4 criteria for IBS, it's very similar, but this is a cystic fibrosis definition for constipation. Abdominal pain and or distension, reduced frequency of bowel movements in the last few weeks or months, and increased consistency of stool in the last few weeks or months. So symptoms of one and two are relieved by the use of laxatives. So a lot of overlap with that definition for IBS, constipation. And so constipation here is defined as one plus two A or two B plus three. And again, we know that our cystic fibrosis population um, uh, endorses constipation. You can see here, uh, compared to the standardized, um, you know, all of the numbers fall to the right in terms of uh, rectal symptoms, stool symptoms, uh, early satiety, nausea, vomiting, bloating, upper abdominal pain, which may be related to lower issues. And indeed, in, in the Galaxy study, they show a 21% prevalence for constipation and uh, many of the uh, individuals that responded endorsed um, very, uh, very uh, common constipation issues such as straining, fullness, incomplete bowel movements, bloating, distension, upper abdominal pain, and lower abdominal pain. We often uh, talk about DOS and constipation together, but I remind you that DOS is actually very uncommon uh, although unique to cystic fibrosis, um, according to the registry, still um, not very common, less than 2%. So symptoms and diagnosis of DOS and constipation, I think of constipation as more of a chronic condition uh, that can certainly lead to DOS, uh, but I, I, I'm combining them together. Um, symptoms, uh, we think of DOS as a meconium ileus equivalent. And DOS is more acute um, uh, and requires hospitalization. And constipation would be more subacute and chronic. Obviously, these patients have abdominal distension, that possible palpable mass in the right lower quadrant. We have to think about a differential. You know, it could be intussusception, volvulus, appendicitis. Remember, our CF uh, population is at higher risk for malignancy, so please keep that in mind. It can be a clinical diagnosis, but we think about doing x-rays um, such as KUBs and CAT scans. And this is one example of a CAT scan that shows significant stool burden. Pathophysiology of DOS, intestinal dysmotility, or for constipation as well, intestinal inflammation, fat malabsorption, which activates the ileal break, and defective iron and water secretion into the gut lumen, 
risk factors, severe CFTR genotype, advanced pulmonary disease. Um, most individuals are pancreas um, insufficient. They may have had a history of meconium ileus. Uh, by the time they become adults, though, they often do not remember. Um, lung transplant uh, obviously increases your risk, especially in the post-op period. And episodes may be preceded by steatorrhea. We certainly uh, know that dehydration can also be a risk factor. And if you've had an episode of DOS, it increases your risk in, uh, for future episodes by tenfold. What are the treatment options for constipation and DOS? Osmotic laxatives, stimulant laxatives, mucomist or N-acetylcysteine has been tried. And you can see they work by a number of different mechanisms. Uh, uh, docusate or colase is listed, but we really don't utilize that very often in constipation DOS treatment. I highlight the Cochrane review that um, just came out a few years ago, um, it, which uh, highlights that there's a clear lack of evidence for the treatment of DOS in people with CF, and I would also say for constipation. And certainly this is an area where um, people use a lot of different treatments based on anecdotal experience, case reports, observational studies. So more randomized control studies are needed. If they're not responding to oral therapies or enemas, we can certainly do hyperosmolar contrast enema, reflexing into the terminal ileum to help evacuate the stool. I highlight um, that there are a number of other constipation treatments, which I mentioned in the IBS pharmacology slide. Lubroprostone, which is a chloride channel activator. Um, but how, however, CFTR may be required for function, so it's usually used as an adjunct to um, osmotic laxatives. Linaclotide or placanotide or guanylate cyclate agonists, which both of these stimulate chloride and sodium and fluids into the lumen. Um, there have been small case reports uh, looking at these patients, uh, sorry, looking at these agents and CF individuals uh, with some success. And there's even less known about the other agents that are available. Uh, this is in press, but this is the Galaxy study on the use of GI medications. Um, the first column is pediatric, the second column is adults, and the third column is total. And you can just see that a uh, number of patients are on constipate or have constipation are on um, osmotic laxatives. Usually, polyethylene glycol is the most common. Um, you can see linaclotide, lubroprostone, and others are make a small number. And compared to PPIs, that um, not as well utilized. So how do we manage constipation and DOS? Uh, remember that constipation is a spectrum to DOS, so we uh, really want to prevent um, DOS and keep patients uh, moving their bowels regularly. So I keep at-risk patients on polyethylene glycol. I teach our patients to recognize early symptoms and start oral therapy at high doses at home if they think it's happening. If they can't tolerate oral therapy, we get them emitted. We may do an NG tube and do colonoscopy cleanouts orally as well as um, through the NG tube or enemas. We minimize pain medications. I mentioned the hyperosmolar contrast enemas, mucomist, and then once they've resolved the acute episode, we consider those other agents with very limited data. We recommend adherence to PERT therapy and surgical consultation is a last resort. So my take-home points are that CF is a multi-system disease that involves the GI tract. GI symptoms are very common in cystic fibrosis, and I really point you to the Galaxy study that's in press. And many of our treatments and diagnoses are based on the non-CF population and focus on symptom relief, and I think we're limited in that setting. And so there's ample opportunity for research in this area to see if our individuals with cystic fibrosis uh, uh, need different diagnosis, need different treatment algorithms. And then I'll put a plug in for my research study that I'm doing. Thank you. So next we have Dr. Reza Hajazi, um, who will be talking about the evaluation and management of gastroparesis in patients with cystic fibrosis. So Dr. Hijazi is an associate professor of medicine in Kansas University Medical Center. He's been an active leading member of various GI associations who current, and currently serves as co-chair of research, the research committee at the American Foregut Society. His research and clinical interests include gastrointestinal motility, 
pancreatic disease, and GI disease, and cystic fibrosis, and pancreatic insufficiency. Dr. Hijazi. morning. Thank you, Chris. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Duran, um, for inviting me to present the gastroparesis in this uh, wonderful meeting. Um, so I was asked to talk about gastroparesis management evaluation in patients with cystic fibrosis. I have no financial disclosure associated with this presentation. Um, gastroparesis is a relatively common disease in, in uh, adult patient. Um, the, the major etiology of diabetes, idiopathic and post-surgical, as age adjusted is about 10 on over 10, 100,000 in male and 38 on female. It's usually it's more common in female. As, uh, as an overall estimate is a 10 to 15 patient or individual in the United States with diagnosis of gastroparesis. Uh, so it's, it's in significantly affect the quality of life and uh, the health burden. So the, again, it's etiology. The most etiology is like it, between the idiopathic and diabetic gastroparesis. The second is after that is post-surgical. And we have a lot of this miscellaneous, um, you know, other disease, including cystic fibrosis, which is one of the etiology uh, for the gastroparesis. So well, what's the ep epidemiology of gastroparesis and cystic fibrosis? So um, in regard to wonderful uh, galaxy group uh, study, we see that this uh, upper GI symptom, which some of them could be attributed to gastroparesis, is, is relatively common in patients with cystic fibrosis. As you see, the nausea, bloating, feeling of gassiness, and you know, uh, in, increased abnormal GERD are, are very common in, uh, in this study based on the, the CF-founded Galaxy study. So um, based on the one of the um, meta-analysis done in 19 a study of the seven country and have um, included 574 patients with cystic fibrosis and uh, using the uh, frequency of gastroparesis it was high as about like 38 percent although I should say that this study is based on a different methodology to uh, measure gastric emptying but overall is about 30 to 40 percent of patients of cystic fibrosis have some degree of delayed gastric emptying. So again, this is, a, is a something is a common in patients with cystic fibrosis. Um, our group also did uh, uh, in a study of the prevalence and incidence of gastroparesis in post-lung and heart-lung transplant, which is a systematic review of meta-analysis. On the prevalence of gastroparesis, we did on a combination of symptoms uh, and symptom and gastric emptying tests. It was 26 and 50 percent a lung transplant and uh, and heart and lung transplant. Uh, lung transplant, secondary cystic fibrosis has the higher rate of gastric uh, gastroparesis. It could be there's like a secondary evidence of that, you know, a more frequent gastric and uh, delayed gastric in the, in the patient with the cystic fibrosis. Um, so how we diagnose a gastroparesis? Uh, so basically, this is a, we have two entities. One is Delayed gastric emptying, other entity, entity is a gastroparesis. Delayed gastric, gastric emptying is just a test. Gastroparesis is a test and symptom. So what we use the um, uh, diagnostic modality is just scintigraphy, radionuclide, gastric emptying test. We could use wireless motility capsule. And this is a, a, some uh, limited evidence of using a breath test. So the definition is more than 10% of retention at four hours. So the gold standard for gastric emptying test is four hour radionuclide as a study. So this is a standard meal, which is a 120 gram of the label, egg, egg, egg beater with a slice of bread and, and strawberry jam and the water. This is like 255 calories. So this is the definition is at 10% at four hours. So what other modality could potentially use is a smart pill, which is a system measuring three elements. So the element they are using is a pH. The first patient is digest the, the, uh, a capsule, so reach the stomach in a, in a second. So as you see, it's reached the stomach and the pH drops significantly. From the first drop in pH to the second increase the pH, this is the gastric emptying test. Uh, 
because when you uh, capsule reach the uh, duodenum, um, uh, pH will, will raise. So this is the gastric emptying test. But the beauty of this test is you could uh, measure the GI transit time in a small intestine when the second drop in pH, the capsule reached the cecum. So um, this is a test that could be used, and I know that Duran uh, is doing some research on this. Yeah. Um, so what's the pathophysiology of gastroparesis? Uh, basically, when we have the normal gastric function, the gastric motility controlled by a slow gastric wave, uh, which um, start with the intracells of Cajal. And electrical activity began at the junction of the fundus and body with a frequency of three cycles per minute. And this wave conducts a circular, circumferential and um, distally toward the pylorus to moving the food to the pylorus. This is a coupling is important here. An enteric nervous system also is a played a big role in this. We have also the hormonal um, um, regulation of the ghrelin, motilin, and cholecystokinin. What happens in gastroparesis, the vagus nerve neuropathy is a fewer antral contraction. Uh, we have decreased gastric tone. We have impaired um, antroduodenal motility, antral uh, hypomotility, or pylorus spasm. That's what happens. It could be bradygastria or tachygastria. And also sometimes the hormonal change play a role. So it's, it's very complex and more than one mechanism is involved. So what is important of interstitial cells of Cajal is um, the lack of interstitial cells of Cajal has been studied in several studies, including one of the study uh, that my, one of my previous mentor did and they found the full thickness biopsy, the lack of interstitials of Cajal in cardio and body with a patient with the diabetic gastroparesis. So how do we evaluate the patient with the severity? So essential, it's the severity of gastroparesis essential for the treatment plan. So we um, basically formulating management plan, where, um, quality of life, uh, predominant symptoms, and also we use um, uh, a system we call GCSI, which is a predicting and also um, um, quantify the numbers of symptoms patients have. So this is a GSI. GCSI uh, is already uh, validated as a questionnaire for the gastroparesis. Here you see that the element is from zero to five, and his patients is when you patient come to your uh, to the clinic. So we use that based on this symptom as a baseline in the follow-up. So the many studies in the um, world of gastroparesis, they use this as a tool for the treatment um, improvement. So what would be the general measure for the patient with the gastroparesis? So first we confirm the diagnosis, determine the possible etiology. If the patient has diabetes, we try to control diabetes. It's important as psychologic intervention and consideration and evaluate the other coexisting symptoms. Many of those patients, including the patient with the cystic fibrosis, has, uh, they have a lot of other symptoms associated with that need to be addressed. So the treatment of gastroparesis. So first we have, a, when, we, when we establish a diagnosis based on the symptoms and uh, four hour gastric emptying test, we restore hydration, electrolyte, nutrition. Uh, we have a diet we call gastroparesis diet. I encourage you to use um, the gastroparesis diet also uh, consult a nutritionist speci specifically with a patient with a cystic fibrosis is very important because they, they have other needs so they need to be very uh, carefully followed by the nutritionist about the gastroparesis and other requirements. So and treatment is a anti-emetic, restore coordinated gastric emptying, uh, gastric and small motility by prokinetic and glycemic control, pain control, psychologic consideration. Um, Botol um, Botox has been a study in the past that has very minimal role in this regard. And uh, neuroendoscopic treatment, feeding tube, and surgical options. So I will go briefly on this treatment. So dietary modification is usually we, are small, we use a small frequent meals, six to eight meals per day to avoid large meal, high fiber, Avoid high fiber, avoid high fat diet, liquid supplemental, and so try to sit up uh, after you eat. Antiemetic, there is a multiple uh, medication, including phenotizine, uh, transdermal escopolamine patch, 5-HT3 uh, 
antagonist can be used as a um, on down cetron and granny cetron. Uh, antihistaminic also could be used and cannabinoid as been shown some efficacy in this um, regard. Prokinetic, one of the prokinetic was like a godfather of prokinetic we use as a metoclopramide, so it has anti-dopaminergic agonist on, and a minimal on 5-HT4 receptor, and it stimulates the cholinesterase and nitrogenic pathway, uh, has a weak antagonist effect on the 5-HT3 receptor, powerful centric acting anti-emetic. The dose is a 5 to 10 milligram four times a day, but 30 minutes before meals, and um, usually that comes with a different type, um, IVPO, and recently uh, was the uh, inhale. And subcutaneous use also could be, uh, route also could be used. Another medication which uh, not available in the United States and need to be get from the um, special IND is Dompredone, very similar to um, metoclopramide. The main difference is has less uh, blood-brain barrier penetrance and has potentially less side effect. It's not available if you want it. Yeah, it's available in Canada and Mexico and Europe, not in the United States. So this is required, as I said, FDA. Only allows um, based on IND pathway, and it's important to take, to get the EKG at the beginning of every three months because of the long Q interval. Uh, motilin receptor, Agonies uh, is a prototype is main, which you mostly use is erythromycin. It could also be used uh, intravenously as we, um, uh, some of us using for the patient before certain endoscopy or GI bleeding. So it's available in pills, liquid, and intravenous. Uh, the dose is 1.5 to 3 milligram every six hours, and usually is there for hospitalization patient after intravenous. So the oral form is the best to use in, um, to maximize its absorption and those is the one. It's a range of 40 to 250. I usually use 125. Uh, chronic erythromycin is limited by tachyphylaxis, unfortunately. A dosing of prokinetic for prokinetic effect is lower than the needed for the anti-microbacterial um, effect. So it's, there might be challenging because of patients with the cystic fibrosis. They get a lot of other medication. There may be some uh, interaction with other medication. So this is like an overview of the other medication that could potentially use a prokinetic uh, dopaminergic receptor agonist, motilitin, 5-HT4 agonist. Ghrelin, it was like a, some study showing there's some improvement as the study is going on. Uh, cholecystokinin, cholinesterase, and uh, opiate receptor agonist, GABA, and H2 receptor antagonists also. So other agent we could use in some study in some, some situation are um, tricyclic antidepressant, um, relief band, benzodiazepine, and dorpredo. So pain control also important, although pain is not one of the GCSI um, symptom questionnaire, so pain is, is important to recognize pain and address. The differential diagnosis of pain is very wide, so be careful about other cause for the pain, mostly in patients with the cystic fibrosis, and try to avoid narcotic as much as you could. So um, the other treatment, which is, um, um, is trending now and has gained a lot of attention, are uh, endoscopic and surgical options. So uh, back to the pathophysiology, one was the uh, pyloraspasm. Pyloraspasm is a playing role in gastroparesis. So then, it came with the idea of there's a, a pyloric myotomy. So this is an endoscopic pyloromyotomy. So basically, uh, there is a, with, with the endoscopy, you go and find about three to four centimeters from pylorus. You, you, uh, in, you make an incision and do a tunneling. So the tunneling goes all the way to the pylorus go to the, the duodenum. And then after tunneling, you cut the muscle. So they, they're very precise cutting the muscle and, and then you suture it or um, uh, clip it. So this is what we call G poem, uh, endoscopic pyloromyotomy. It sh uh, it's um, been shown that very efficacious in patient of gastroparesis, although uh, 
is very limited data on cystic fibrosis per se. This is a study I found is used in the post-lung transplant in 20 patients with a different um, uh, etiology for the lung transplant. A G poem done up, uh, up to 13 months after the lung transplant. A post-lung transplant was achieved uh, in uh, success rate in uh, 17 or patient or 85 percent with a median follow-up of uh, 8.9 months. Overall, GSCSI symptom improve of those patients. Um, there were all like two or three are the cystic fibrosis. It could be potential just you know a role for the cystic fibrosis, although need more the, more study. That was a, a very limited study in cystic fibrosis with a G point. So the surgical option is also the other option which uh, approved like a few years ago is the gastric electrical stimulation. And approximately 10 to 20 percent of patients with the failed medical therapy may need the other interventions. So, one of those that they call enteral system, which is a, a, a implantable neural stimulation. So, um, this is a device. It comes goes the under subcutaneous fat tissue, mostly either a surgical um, laparoscopy or uh, open surgical intervention. Although I have seen they have done an endoscopy approach as well. So this generator goes to the, under the skin, and the two catheter goes to the, uh, to the stomach. Um, so in 2003, based on the study, the WAVE study, which I go over in a minute, so this device has been FDA approved as a humanitarian device. And this um, WAVE study was in a crossover, uh, double-blinded study, and on 17 patients with, diabetes, uh, with diabetic gastroparesis and 16 with uh, idiopathic gastroparesis. The WAVE study showed the high frequency and low energy of gastric electrical stimulation in a patient with a gastroparesis. Uh, stimulation frequency of the 12 cycle per minute or 0 0.1 seconds and 5 seconds of a train of 14 hertz, uh, the plus frequency of the 5 milliamp Strength, so 33 patient, as I said, 17 diabetes, 16 idiopathic. Initially uh, subject to one month on or off stimulation in a double blind crossover design and, late, and later followed by the another 12, 11 months. Um, yeah, patient under gastric electrical stimulation on, um, achieved a significant reduction of weekly vomiting frequency and majority of patients preferred on on. And the next 18 months, 80% of, of patients reported more than 50% improvement in vomiting and quality of life. And in majority of patients uh, had improvement in gastric emptying, it still has not returned to normal. So there is some improvement in quality of life and uh, nausea and vomiting based on the uh, stimulation, gastric electrical stimulation. Um, so um, there, one, one caveat here, so how we, uh, which patient, which way it goes. Like, so um, study done before, um, we, we proposed that, you know, based on um, the symptom, symptomatology and um, gastric emptying tests, just stratify delayed gastric emptying based on the percentage as at four hours, so 10 to 20 percent, 10 to 25 percent as mild, more than 25 to uh, 35 percent as moderate, and more than 30 percent as severe. So, and then based on our the other study that we have done, so we we found we stratified which patient goes to which category. So, as you see here, patient with the mild, with the mild, um, either mild um, diabetic or um, or idiopathic gastroparesis mostly uh, ended up in um, medical group, and a patient with this severe uh, gastroparesis either ended up in the surgery or uh, neurostimulation. So basically, more symptoms require more treatment. That's an easy um, conclusion of this. Uh, other surgical option here is a uh, feeding tube, the general tube is preferred and pyloroplasty, surgical pyroplasty, total gastrectomy, and or the newer gastric electrical stimulation they call gastric pacing. So um, this is an algorithm we use uh, for 
adult patient with the gastroparesis. So either when a patient comes, so we have to go to either category of the uh, first, um, to establish the diagnosis, then use um, gastroparesis diet, and either category based on the symptoms, based on the ma major symptoms, based on the severity of symptom, based on the severity of gastro, uh, gastric emptying. So either patient go to the to use a prokinetic nutritional support, and or anti-emetic and or analgesic. So as summary, gastroparesis is common in patients with the gastroparesis. Symptoms will usually overlap with other symptoms of the gas, uh, uh, other aspect of the GI with the gastroparesis, including gas bloating, reflux. For our gastric emptying, there's a gold standard for the diagnosis. In gastric emptying definition is more than uh, 10 or more than, um, or more 10% uh, at the fourth hour. Diet is very important. I encourage you to use um, your nutritional support for that. And so medical therapy, anti-emetic, prokinetic, analgesic, endoscopic treatment, including uh, gastric pyloromyotomy is promising. It shows some uh, promising and study surgical intervention, including feeding tube, neurostimulation, gastrectomy for very severe cases. So for, uh, the other um, study that or, um, it could be potentially is the long-term study and follow-up with the patient with the newer CFTR modulator on GI symptom or gastroparesis, the role of evolving endoscopic treatment, including g -pone, and early detection and diagnosis of delayed gastric emptying is important. Thank you. Thank you all for um, continuing to show interest as well as um, submitting questions in the platform. So we have a lot of good ones to review. We look forward to discussing them after we finish the next um, portion of the symposium, which is going to be a discussion via video by uh, Dr. Jody Barkin and Dr. Nicole Green um, regarding point counterpoint given everything we've discussed, should we be doing routine foregut motility testing on patients with CF, or should we not be doing routine um, motility testing in patients with CF? So Dr. Green is an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington School of Medicine and an attending physician in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at Seattle Children's. She's a site PI for various studies, multi-institutional endeavors, um, determining the utility of abdominal ultrasound to predict the advance to predict advanced liver disease in pediatric patients with cystic fibrosis. Dr. Green um, it collaborates on various CF-related projects and really is interested in figuring out ways to prevent the onset of advanced CF lung disease. Dr. Jody Barkin is an associate professor of clinical medicine in the Division of Digest Digestive Health and Liver Disease at the University of Miami. He is the Associate Medical Director of the Pancreatic Disease Center. Um, he is a member of various different local and national committees um, and has a particular interest in premalignant and malignant diseases of the pancreas, as well as small bowel and therapeutic endoscopy in particular as it relates to patients with cystic fibrosis. So we will upload their talk right now. gastroenterologist at Seattle Children's Hospital and I One am second. joined by my co-presenter Dr. Jody Bob. So you can hear but not see. Just bear with me for one second. 
I am Nicole Green. I am a pediatric gastroenterologist at Seattle Children's Hospital, and I am joined by my co-presenter, Dr. Jody Barkin, who's an adult gastroenterologist and associate professor of clinical medicine at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. And today we would like to talk to you about the role of foregut testing in cystic fibrosis. So neither myself nor Dr. Barkin have any relationships to disclose related to this presentation. So today's objectives are to recognize common GI uh, or upper GI symptoms in people with CF, understand the diagnostic workup of foregut manifestations, including the risks and benefits associated with specific tests, and really to discuss, discuss the role of foregut testing in people with CF undergoing lung transplantation and to think about whether we should be recommending universal testing versus directed testing in those with symptoms. So common GI manifestations of CF, or at least upper GI manifestations, include gastroesophageal reflux or gastroesophageal reflux disease, gastroparesis, feeding intolerance, malnutrition, inflammation, dysbiosis, and even upper GI tract malignancy. Common symptoms that you might hear are nausea, vomiting, heartburn, abdominal pain, abdominal bloating, and early satiety or lack of appetite. So the starting with GERD or GERD, um, the prevalence of GERD in CF based on 2020 CF registry data ranges from 30 to 40 percent, um, and this is excluding those who received a transplant. The difficulty here in terms of prevalence data is the methods used to assess reflux in CF, so whether this was based on symptom surveys or perhaps more objective testing, such as um, pH impedance, or based on medications that were prescribed. Um, another study looking at reflux um, based on pH impedance in CF found a relatively high, a very high prevalence really of 67% in pediatric individuals and 87% of adults with CF. The other really important thing to remember is, especially when considering lung transplant, is that silent reflux is reported in up to 60% of adults. Thinking about other upper GI tract motility or disorders, um, gastroparesis is one that is talked about relatively commonly in CF, with a prevalence um, based on a 2016 systematic review of about 38%. However, like reflux, results sort of are not consistent in terms of prevalence data because it varies based on diagnostic methods used in different studies. And actually, some studies might say that um, patients with CF have more rapid gastric emptying, some say the same as normal controls, and some um, delayed. Um, the thing to think about, though, is it actually may increase following lung transplantation, especially in CF um, individuals. Intestinal motility looking at small bowel transit is generally thought to be somewhat delayed in cystic fibrosis. Um, Gelfand et al. Um, did a small study using a wireless motility capsule in 10 um, adults with CF and found significant delay in small bowel um, intestinal transit compa compared to healthy controls, but actually no difference in colon or whole gut transit. This is, again, CF registry data from 2020 looking at the number of individuals receiving a lung transplantation. Um, and as of 2020, there are about 1,700 um, CF individuals who uh, were transplant recipients, um, and about there were 97 patients who received a, a lung transplantation in um, 2020. So decrease from previous years, maybe that's um, partially due to modulators, but um, definitely still a significant patient population to consider. So thinking about reflux and upper GI dysmotility and how it might affect the lung transplant, 
Um, so they're actually conflicting reports on the effect of reflux on pulmonary function, but what we worry about is that reflux may lead to the development of bronchiolitis obliterans and then worsen lung transplant outcomes. Delayed gastric emptying has also been linked to a higher risk of chronic lung allograft dysfunction independent of reflux. GERD is more prevalent in CF based on many studies with a higher prevalence of proximal reflux, meaning reflux reaching the upper esophagus, which again is obviously more um, concerning in terms of lung health. Um, and that was based on studies comparing CF transplant recipients to those who've undergone lung transplant for other uh, reasons. And then the other thing to think about specific to the CF population is that they may have underlying dysmotility that might pose unique challenges and further complicate the post-transplant pathology. So when we're considering um, the role of universal full gut testing and whether this should be performed in RCF population undergoing lung transplant evaluation, we need to weigh the risk of untreated or undiagnosed disease versus the associated risks, times, and cost of um, universal testing. In terms of what we have at our disposal for full gut testing from the GI perspective, um, there is, you know, imaging studies such as an esophagram. We have esophagogastroduodenoscopy or EGD. Um, manometry studies, so antroduodenal or esophageal manometry. pH impedance, Bravo pH, um, and gastric emptying scintigraphy. So um, Dr. Barkin and I will go through these um, testing modalities and discuss what their role is, um, what they can diagnose versus what they can't, um, and the risks and benefits associated with each test. So the esophagram or upper GI um, is commonly ordered um, and it's a fluoroscopic imaging study. And what's important to remember is this is really an anatomic study. It assesses anatomic abnormalities, so strictures, hernias, um, tracheoesophageal fistulas, or any sort of mechanical obstruction. A sulfogram or upper GI series really should not be used for a diagnosis of reflux, and it really is not a reliable test for assessing upper GI motility. Sometimes radiologists will com comment on the upper GI motility based on a sulfogram, but really it is not a reliable test. Um, you should think about ordering an esophagram if someone has persistent vomiting, persistent or concerning reflux symptoms, recurrent pneumonia or frequent coughing, especially in the pediatric population, um, because you might there might be a missed TE fistula. Um, risks of the a study, you know, this is done awake, um, so there's no anesthesia, but there is radiation associated with the study. Um, but the advantage is that this is widely available across centers. An EGD uses an endoscope to directly visualize the upper GI tract mucosa. Um, and, you know, we also recommend taking biopsies to characterize inflammation. So this is useful for assessing conditions that might mimic GERD, but conditions that you might want to um, treat or address or be aware of prior to a lung transplant. So EOE, um, gastritis, um, Barrett's esophagus, or even esophageal adenocarcinoma. Indications for an EGD of, you know, especially in kids, feeding aversions or difficulties, um, especially because children often won't really um, elaborate on dysphagia, unexplained vomiting, poor growth or weight gain, and of course, upper GI bleeding. The risks of the procedure are um, anesthesia risks. So in pediatrics, we perform EGDs under general anesthesia, um, but adults also um, have sedation for EGDs. So something specific to consider um, in a CF patient with poor lungs. Um, the risks of the procedure itself, um, we talk about bleeding or perforation, they're really rare, but something also to um, discuss with the patient and, and to risk profile. Limitations of using an EGD or the EGD is that even if you don't have histologic disease or inflammation, that does not necessarily um, rule out um, reflux. So you could have a non-erosive reflux disease um, that could still impact the a lung transplant. 
Um, luckily, this is widely available um, across centers as well. Um, the last test I will be discussing is the antriduodenal manometry, and this assesses full gut motor function by recording intraluminal pressure in the antrum and proximal small intestine. Um, and this is using a catheter that's usually inserted nasally or through a G or a J stoma if a patient has that. Um, it helps differentiate a true motility disorder from a somatoform disorder. So often it's used to sort of diagnose or classify types of pseudo obstruction. Really, this test should only be used for like severe nausea or retching or inability to tolerate enteral feeds. Um, it can be used to uh, differentiate between rumination and vomiting um, and may also be helpful in looking at effect of medications on the stomach and small bowel motility. Risks, again, uh, in pediatrics, ca the catheter placement is placed under anesthesia because it's typically not well tolerated in um, pediatrics. Um, and the test is performed in the hospital setting, so it would require you know, usually two days of hospitalization or at least a day. Uh, the other thing to consider is there is really a lack of data establishing normal patterns and control. So you may have atypical patterns um, be present in healthy um, and asymptomatic adults, um, and you may see artifacts uh, for moving or straining. The really important thing to think about is that this test should really only be ordered or at least performed and interpreted by a motility expert just to um, make sure we don't get too many of these sort of normal complicating artifacts um, and someone who really understands the patient um, when they're assessing this test. So less widely available um, as specific expertise and training is required for interpretation. So now I'm going to um, hand over to Dr. Barkin, who will um, complete, discuss some more of the upper full gut testing we have available. Thank you, Dr. Green. It's my honor to um, speak to you today. Um, today we're gonna talk about esophageal manometry, and this is with the nasogastric catheter that's placed um, followed by multiple swallows of different liquid consistencies, including clear liquids and then puree. But remember, this is primarily done awake, as sedation may affect the motility. We use this to diagnose dysmotility. So, for example, patients with dysphagia, a concern for achalasia, um, esophageal spasm. And that's really where manometry serves as the gold standard for diagnosis of dysmotility. We can diagnose a hiatal hernia and exclude, for example, achalasia, which may complicate a hiatal hernia repair. And we can also combine this with 24-hour pH and PEANS testing. Next slide, please. There are some risks to this. Primarily, um, it's uncomfortable as a patient may be awake or may not tolerate catheter passage. And we have to think about um, nasal or sinus surgeries uh, when we're placing these catheters. Thankfully, it doesn't require anesthesia, but the availability is to some degree variable as it does need specialty equipment and expertise. Next slide. When we have these, uh, this is the way the readings look. You can see on the top left, there's um, the upper esophageal sphincter and then a swallow is initiated, kind of that hockey stick pattern. And then you see the lower esophageal sphincter, which is the usually green bar on the bottom. Next slide. pH impedance testing can be combined with manometry. This is where that catheter is inserted and remains in place for 24 hours with the patient completing a symptoms diary to evaluate for GERD esophageal acid exposure, laryngeal pharyngeal reflux, or esophageal pharyngeal reflux. And then we can also look at symptom correlation. And it really is the gold standard for diagnosis of GERD. Remember, GERD may compromise a potential transplant, and it also can evaluate for non-acid refluxate, including gas, liquid, and air refluxate. And we can then correlate it with symptoms. Next slide. The risks, again, are similar to those with esophageal manometry. The key additional risks are that the catheter remains in place for 24 hours as if the patient does go home with it, and therefore there can be, to some extent, discomfort, though this is usually short-lived, and lost productivity if the patient's absent from work or school and the time to return the catheter. Important, you may need a soft manometry or an endoscopy to guide for anatomic landmarks and evaluation of a hiatal hernia, 
that may compromise the ability to interpret this. Remember, there are some degree of anesthesia needed in pediatric patients at times, but otherwise no, and again, similar variability. Next slide. Bravo pH monitoring is something we'll touch on for a second. This is an implantable pH monitoring device that's put in the distal esophagus, and then patients record their symptoms of GERD. But remember, it only measures esophageal acid exposure. The benefit is that there's not an indwelling nasogastric catheter, and it can last for 48 to 96 hours, but it doesn't measure proximal refluxate or non-acid refluxate, and you have to have endoscopic guided placement, which again has the risks of endoscopy and the cost of endoscopy that we've talked about. Next slide. The manometry interpretation from uh, pH Bravo monitoring looks similar. For example, what we would see in pH impedance is you can see a series of um, episodes measuring reflux and then also um, the area where the catheter is placed. Next. And the last test we'll talk about is gastric emptying scintigraphy. This is where patients ingest a meal of radioactive isotope mixed with egg beaters, toast, and jam, as well as have some water. Occasionally, there are some other types of protocols using oatmeal or liquid-only versions. However, the national standardized protocol is that meal. And then images are taken at one, two, and four hours post-ingestion, measuring gastric attention of that mixed meal. And this is done to evaluate for gastroparesis, which may present with symptoms including bloating, early satiety, epigastric discomfort, nausea, vomiting, and potentially reflux. And the benefits are that this is non-invasive, it does diagnose gastroparesis, and thankfully, because it's a nuclear medicine test, there's no radiation exposure. Next slide. There are some risks, though, which is that this is time-consuming. It takes over four hours to perform. Some food allergies, for example, if a patient has an egg allergy. We may have variable interpretations and, to some degree, day-to-day -day variability. So this may have misdiagnosis. And the caution here is that if a patient has a borderline test, it may be worth repeating if they have a high suspicion for gastroparesis. Unfortunately, don't have good normalized protocols in pediatric patients, but in the adult population, the national standardized protocol is helpful. And there are several other types of homegrown protocols, including two-hour measurements that may lead to misdiagnosis. Doesn't need anesthesia and is relatively available. So when we think about any of these tests, remember that really communication is key the hard part is interpreting these tests in a black box without the clinical context of taking care of that specific patient and understanding how that test may help guide your therapy or your interventions. And so when we understand the clinical context, we can improve our understanding and interpretation of where those results fit in that specific patient's clinical picture. And this is where it may be helpful to have comprehensive centers that help unify the care of our patients such that, for example, the radiologist is able to access the same records as the gastroenterologist, as the pulmonologist, and therefore we can better coordinate the care of the patient. So as Dr. Green presented earlier, this is really the balancing act that we think of in a specific test of the risk of untreated or undiagnosed disease with the risk, time, or cost of testing. But remember, the key part here is the third factor which is that we're talking about a high-risk population and a resource-limited environment in the setting of transplant, but we don't want to compromise that potential investment that's been made in a patient. So the questions we have to think about really are what are the yield of testing, if it's symptomatic testing versus universal testing. If a test was found to be abnormal, could the condition be that subsequently corrected pre-transplant or at the time of transplant? And if we didn't treat it, what would happen in that patient? And then what are the potential risks of undergoing testing? Really, it's a question of where do we draw the line and what's the best number needed to treat where we're all comfortable saying a test should be either universally applied or only with symptoms. When we conceptualize a framework, there are six key factors, one being the yield of testing, the risk, like we've talked about, of untreated conditions, how available is that testing, how costly is the testing, how time consuming is that testing? And then what are the specific risks? For example, anesthesia risks. And then the last part is that if we find a test that meets an acceptable threshold for all of these, and it diagnoses a condition that we can't do anything about, is that something that's beneficial? And in some cases, yes, and in some cases, no, but we have to think about does a therapy or intervention exist that may change our clinical care as a result of that test? 
So in summary of the testing modalities that we've seen, remember certain tests are invasive, such as endoscopy, manometry, and pH impedance testing. With endoscopy and manometry require, excuse me, intraduodenal manometry requiring potential anesthesia. But these are variable in time and in cost, with endoscopy being the most costly but antroduodenal manometry, for example, having the cost of the test plus potentially the cost of endoscopy and hospitalization. And then these have variable availability. As Dr. Green alluded to in the beginning, this is really the mechanism of injury and where we can potentially have targets for intervention with these tests. So if there's pre-transplant GERD dysmotility, that may get worse after transplant or be new onset after transplant, then that GERD may activate the innate immune system, leading to bronchiolitis obliterans, and that may cause rejection, graft failure, and mortality. So can we rely on reflux symptoms alone? The short answer is not so much. But in 109 patients with advanced lung disease, unfortunately reflux symptoms were not predictive of the presence of reflux. Abnormal esophageal motility was very common, GERD was common, and in those that had GERD, half of them had proximal refluxate. So about a third of patients right off the bat have proximal refluxate. And other studies showed asymptomatic non-acid reflux and poor esophageal clearance led to graft injury. So this is something where really we have to conceptualize that GERD may be the key pathogenic mechanism here. And GERD and dysmotility are unfortunately common in adults post-transplant and associated with rejection. In this study, they looked at the abnormal motility results and abnormal impedance results. In the top left graph, we see that impedance testing was abnormal in 62%, manometry in 83%, pH testing in 37%. And in the red box on the bottom right, that was leading to an increased odds ratio of rejection with an abnormal motility test or an abnormal impedance test. Now, there was a separate study of 72 patients that showed similarly high rates of motility abnormalities, but no relation in that population to chronic allograft dysfunction. So this may still be of a bit of debate, of debate, but the answer is when we look, we're going to find. In pediatric patients, this was 30 patients out of Boston Children's. Again, less common than in adult patients, but impedance testing abnormal in about 27%, pH testing abnormal in 40%, and gastric dysmotility abnormal in about a quarter of patients. Now, interestingly here, reflux burden didn't affect rejection, but gastric dysmotility did, independent of GERD, have an increased risk of allograft dysfunction. And Unfortunately, when we compare cystic fibrosis patients to other patients undergoing lung transplant, CF patients have increased likelihood of GERD and dysmotility. In this study of 88 patients out of Loyola, Chicago, undergoing post-lung transplant, pH monitoring, esophageal manometry, gastric emptying study, and barium swallows, we can see in the red box on the bottom side, in for example, GERD was far more common with distal refluxate, 90% of patients with CF versus 54% of patients without CF. And comparing that, 70% of patients with proximal refluxate with CF, 29% without CF. So not only is GERD common, but proximal reflux is common. And then the question is, do we have an ability to intervene and change the curve? So this study compared 48 patients undergoing lung transplant with pre-transplant anti-reflux surgery to early post-transplant to late post-transplant early reflux surgery, and then looked at graft dysfunction. And as we can see here on the Kaplan-Meier curve to the right, late post-lung transplant anti-reflux surgery had an increased risk of allograft injury. In patients undergoing pre-transplant or early post-transplant anti-reflux surgery, this was equally effective. So what we've done here is to try to best summarize whether we should think about symptoms only testing or universal testing in an adapted our version of a forest plot that we're all familiar with from seeing in meta-analyses. And really we can think about esophagrams and endoscopies in patients 
but this could be done either for symptoms or universal. Intraduodenal manometry may be better reserved for patients with symptoms given the complex nature and lack of availability. We should think about esophageal manometry and pH impedance testing in potentially all of our patients given the high risks of dysmotility in these patients and proximal reflux. Bravo pH testing doesn't assess for proximal reflux, so again, helpful but not be all end all. And gastric emptying scintigraphy, given the non invasive nature and potential risks of gastric dysmotility, with common factors of gastric dysmotility, really should be considered in patients. Our take home points are that to remember GERD, esophageal dysmotility, and gastric dysmotility are not only common in cystic fibrosis but oftentimes asymptomatic and don't correlate well with symptoms. They may have nuance at after transplant or worsen after transplant and unfortunately may compromise lung transplant graft function. And therefore we really need to give careful consideration for pre-transplant testing in CF patients. We do need better data to guide future best practice recommendations, but at least for the time being, one should consider in at least selected patients universal testing regardless of symptoms. On behalf of Dr. Green and myself, we'd like to thank you. These are our email addresses. Please feel free to reach out to us. Unfortunately, we couldn't join everyone as we would have liked to in Philadelphia, but we're honored to have been able to have this opportunity and hopefully share our knowledge and recommendations with you. And we'd be happy to answer any questions after the session via email. We hope that you have a wonderful time at the rest of NACFC 2022 in Philadelphia. Thanks again. Thank you everybody for staying. Um, so we have limited time and um, there are many great questions and we try to kind of summarize that in a few few questions I'm going to just, you know, um, ask doctors um, who, or presenters. So maybe may I request Reza and all of you guys come on in here. No, I think I'm, I'm good. I'm good. You can get, yeah, that's fine. All right, so the first and, you know, highly admired question is to um, Dr. King. Uh, it's about the treatment. So if the treatment for GERD is not useful, we should still provide it or think about, you know, other options like anti-reflux surgery or do you have any comments about that? Sure. I think the, the first comment is when we're talking about reflux treatment, what I always tell my patients is the very first uh, consideration is are we trying to fix an esophageal issue or are we trying to fix or, or prevent a pulmonary issue? From, the, from an esophagus standpoint, if you have abnormal testing, reflux esophagitis, uh, certainly PPIs and acid-reducing medications have been shown to clearly be helpful. With regard to the lungs, I really counsel my patients about three different things. Where, where in the absence of heartburn or indigestion, we do not discuss uh, acid-reducing medications. We go right to lifestyle modifications. We use other medications uh, that are not traditional anti-reflux medications, but may have an impact on the lower esophageal sphincter, keeping it tighter, reducing relaxations of the lower esophageal sphincter, thus potentially reducing the number of reflux episodes, and then anti-reflux surgery. So with regard to lifestyle modifications, we generally talk about avoiding um, substances that may increase reflux, such as caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, chocolate, um, carbonation, uh, not eating too close to going to bed, sleeping with the head of the bed elevated. Um, although uh, many studies have shown that although more reflux happens during the day when we are awake, at night when we're not necessarily conscious of our reflux, that's when we're at more risk of aspiration. So even though we have fewer reflux events overnight, we're probably at higher risk of aspiration. So sleeping with the head of the bed elevated can be helpful. I then use um, two medications very frequently in these patients. One is baclofen and the other is bethanicol, both that have been shown to increase tone of the lower esophageal sphincter, decrease relaxation of that sphincter, thus potentially decreasing reflux episodes. And then finally, if neither of those is helpful, that's when we discuss anti-reflux surgery. Thank you. Next question is for Dr. Hijazi. Um, 
is there a risk of dumping syndrome after GPOM, um, like other um, gastric surgeries for, for, the, uh, for the gastroparesis? Um, any other potential adverse effects other than potentially treatment failure? Yeah, um, well, basically, we, we want to have a dumping syndrome. I mean, we, we want to just accelerate the gastric emptying test. That was the, one of the pathophysiology of the gastroparesis is a pyloresposm. So with the yeah, gastric pyloromyotomy, and we want just to accelerate to the point that is like this, that's, that's severe to be a accelerated, that much accelerated to be a dumping, it hasn't been reported um, in the studies with non-CF patients. What was the second part of the question? The second part of the question is what adverse effects would you consider beyond treatment failure if you were to perform a per oral pyloroplasty? What adverse effect of what? Any complications that you would yeah, complication or Yeah, of? the complication could happen like a perforation, infection, any endoscopic related um, risk with this procedure, yeah, that, that's a main consideration. The next question is going to be for Dr. Hashem. So Dr. Hashem, um, the question is use of N-acetylcysteine in DIOS. Um, a couple questions were about this. How would you administer it? What's the evidence for it? Um, what's the rationale for using it versus other types of treatment for um, DIOS? So there's very little evidence. It's really anecdotal. Um, as I mentioned, we, you can do it orally. You, uh, you can do it in enemas. Um, so uh, I think most of us do it orally or enemas. I don't know if you, I mean, I can also posit to the, the group because, again, there's no um, evidence-based medicine for uh, the use of n acetylcysteine in this setting. So it's mostly based on our experience. And I actually don't use it very much. I, I tend to have pretty good success with um, large volume uh, polyethylene glycol. I don't know if any of the other. Um, I actually, what I do is when people think that they may be developing DIOS, I get, tell them to do seven capfuls of Marilox in, um, let's say, half a liter of fluid. And then if they haven't had a large bowel movement by then, to repeat it in 12 hours. And yeah. that's the equivalent of a bowel prep. So you um, don't use a lot of uh, N-acetylcysteine either. No, not I a lot. I think the, the smell and the tolerability is difficult for a lot of these um, individuals. And so that's why most of us probably still use polyethylene glycol. So I think the very going, I do like the point system for the question and answer um, format because it shows you what a lot of people are thinking about. The burning question, Dr. King, related to um, the, in some respects, explosive statement regarding the possible risks of PPI therapy. Um, how should we be doing it? Like, what is the, are we doing our, is, should we be stopping and pulling back PPI administration, even though that is a bit of an anathema to our pulmonary colleagues where the thought is, Reducing acid will hopefully protect the lung. What do we do? So, you know, I think this is a super complicated question. And based on the, the two studies that I presented showing a possible increase in risk in those patients on PPIs, these, they, are not, they are not robust studies, randomized controlled studies. And so in my own clinical practice, I think... Um, the first thing I do is in patients who come in to see me who are already on PPIs, and again, in the CF population, that's usually upwards of 50%. The first thing I do is try to figure out why they're on the PPI. And there are many different reasons for these patients to be on PPI. Very frequently, it's due to, it's for help with their pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. And, and if that is their indication, then that very well may be a very valid indication to, have, to keep them on a PPI. The second um, is whether or not there is classic esophageal disease from reflux. So if a patient has Barrett's esophagus, history of severe reflux esophagitis, classic esophageal reflux symptoms like heartburn and indigestion, or have had abnormal testing, then those are indications to keep the patients on a PPI. If a patient has none of those indications for, be, for being on a PPI, and they're on a PPI because uh, somebody along the way felt that reflux was potentially contributing to lung issues, then what I do is I will do uh, reflux, um, tree, uh, excuse me, testing, pH impedance testing off of their PPI. 
to determine uh, how much reflux the patient has, what type it is, acid versus non-acid, um, often with an endoscopy to help determine are there factors that that patient might require a PPI. And if none of those factors are present, then I look to get them off. I also talk with patients about how frequently they have exacerbations, hospitalizations, infections, what type of bugs they're growing out of their sputum, and if there's a suggestion of aspiration based on that, even if in the absence of reflux symptoms, I will do formal reflux testing and make some of those decisions based on that. And I think that is part of the reason why the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, thank you, Dr. King, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation has convened a GRASP GI-related aspiration working group because if we were to go by point tallies here in terms of interest, the, we have 15 points versus the 65 and 135 points in this scheme related to um, GI-related aspiration. So I think that is going to become an increasing priority for the CFF as well as we hope for the greater lung, um, advanced lung disease community. Dr. Hashem, when you're counseling someone on SIBO treatment, how do you expect the symptoms to evolve over the course of treatment? Do you counsel on immediate effects? Any effect, if effect happens, improvement happens, durable, repeated treatments, how would you counsel a patient? Um, so I, I think most people do feel um, better after a course. I usually ask them to wait uh, for the full uh, two-week tr treatment, and we usually dose um, uh, 1,500 milligrams uh, three times a day. Uh, and uh, so I wait for the full treatment. Usually people feel that they... Um, not everyone feels that the symptoms go away completely because I think it's multifactorial in cystic fibrosis. Um, and so I do um, talk to them about that. I think symptoms get better. Um, I think it also has to do with whether you did empiric treatment versus objective testing to some extent. So a lot of times I will try to favor more objective testing because I think sometimes we don't know uh, the true cause in cystic fibrosis individuals. Um, and then... Um, it, when, if symptoms get better and they truly respond um, and they go away and, and they uh, have symptoms recur down the line, I will consider a second or third course of treatment. How do you, approve, how do you approach, we have a, a couple more questions to go through. How do you, what is the landscape in Missouri um, for refaxment approval? Um, a lot of insurance issues or any um, tipsy that you have. Yeah, I do have all, so I think if there's an insurance issue, um, I do try to um, uh, do impair or do testing formally because of the antibiotic resistance and issues with C. diff, et cetera, in, in non-CF uh, <coughs> patients uh, more so. Um, uh, for if Rifaxman, we do have trouble getting approved. Um, it's less so in the last few years, I think, um, but it can be a very, very expensive drug. So I think that is a, an issue for some of our patients. And I would say in the broader GI community, SIBO is an extremely controversial topic with um, some concerns that the strongest advocates for testing and treating have a vested interest in ensuring that people talk about the disorder. I personally try to, although CF patients, as you discussed in your wonderful talk, Dr. Hashem, have risk factors for bacterial overgrowth, so I'm actually more likely to prescribe rifaximin in a patient with CF. Um, but in the greater GI community, there's a concern that even if someone improves and then um, feels worse, which invariably in my personal experience happens, are you going to subject someone to being antimicrobialized for repeated cycles um, year after year? I think that's why we favor rifaximin because it hasn't had a lot of drug-drug interactions or adverse um, side effects like some of the other antibiotics that we commonly use. And for the last question, um, any thoughts? Um, I think this can go to anyone on the panel, but maybe to you, Dr. Hajazi. Um, the use of procalopride when we're thinking about stomach emptying. So it is approved for that in Europe. It's not approved yet in the U.S. What do you think about yeah, using procalopride? There is very limited a study um, on using the procalopride in, um, in gastroparesis, although when you just see the, the, the pharmaceutical, uh, it's like a package insert, and uh, there is uh, evidence that it could potentially increase the gastric emptying, hasn't been approved in the United States. I don't use, per se, for the gastric emptying, uh, delayed gastric emptying. If I see a patient have the severe uh, constipation and they have like a delayed, the concomitant delayed gastric emptying, I use it as a, 
kind of adjunctive therapy. So that's why, um, but this is not an indication approved in the United States for. Just a quick point, uh, Pocalopride is 5-HT4 agonist, um, and 5-HT4 is entirely, you know, spread across the GI tract, so it's not necessarily medication for only gastroparesis or constipation. So patients with esophageal dysmotility, patients with small bowel dysmotility can also, um, you know, get some advantage out of it. So it's not approved yet, um, as he said, but um, probably, hopefully, in the future. But I tend to use it off-label, not in CF patient, but other dysmotility patients other than the CF, and it does, you know, um, um, help a lot. Um, even patients with, I was talking to earlier, another digestive wordy, um, patients with um, NIC, you know, NICU and feeding intolerance and in a small dose, it can actually um, start working almost in a couple days. So again, off-label, can't really you know, uh, promote that as of now, but uh, it's probably a you know, promising upcoming drug. I, How do we get it approved? So if is a question if for, someone doesn't have constipation. It, it, so I think it, what I usually do is I like, do you have constipation? Um, is the way that I approach it. Um, but uh, those of you who are around for cisapride, procalopride is the less cardiotoxic cousin of cisapride. So that's why there's increased excitement because cisapride was a wonderful drug for pan GI motility, but then the heart uh, toxicity made the agent be pulled from the market. So since Dr. Patel and I have to rush over to a round table where we are going to continue discussion actually on pH and PPIs. So if you are burning a desire, so given the interest for, no pun intended, um, given the interest for the topic, uh, we will be headed over to where is the... We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. It's in, it's in, your, um, it's in your app. That concludes the session. Thank you very much.